We are recording. Hey, welcome to the uh, fir um, first April interim meeting of the Transport Area Working Group. Uh, I'm David Black, one of your remote working group chairs. I'm Gary Fetters. I'm also a remote working group chair. And Wes Eddy. So okay, that slide. was Wes. And uh, we have a new area director for this group, so that's Martin. Martin, are you online? I'm here, and I'm happy to be here. Excellent. This is Martin Duke. He's our new responsible AD. I like the word responsible there. <laughs> Little does he know what he was signed up for. So um, if, if I weren't the responsible AD, would that make me the irresponsible AD? That's the other one. We, we have the IETF note well. Um, even though this is a rather odd way to perhaps go about doing ITF business, the ITF note well does apply. So make sure that you are familiar with it. Um, basically, it requires you to think carefully before you speak so that you consider IPR implications. Um, if you already understand this, that's fine. If you don't, then look at this slide. This may help you understand what the implications are. Some instructions here. You probably have seen at least a little bit of this because you've got this far. Uh, but the way in which we're going to run this is using multiple tools. Um, we have the WebEx itself. Um, we will be using the video feed to share a little bit of the presenters, and we will be showing the slides. Um, in the chat room that goes with this, WebEx chat room, we will use primarily for managing the queue. So we don't wish to have discussions on that chat. Uh, please use plus Q, minus Q to add yourself as you need. There will be the Java room. This will be monitored as best we can. And please use that. It's the um, meetings Java room. And there are some how-to notes available from the IETF Secretariat to doing our best to support. Next slide, I guess. Um, mute your mic when you don't need it. Um, because that makes everything better for everyone else. We'll try and manage a queue in a ITF way of running a queue, in which case, please put plus Q into the chat room in WebEx. And we will look for that and we will ask you to speak if you're in that queue. Um, make sure you say, speak your full name. It's pretty difficult for us to find out who's speaking remotely. Um, so please uh, take a little bit of care just to explain who you are before you start, and we'll record the name in the meeting notes. Okay, next slide. Um, we have a note taker, do we? Who, who, who is the note taker? Mm. Did we not have a note taker? <laughs> note taker is muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's Jake. <laughs> Okay, I thought it was going to be you, Jake, but um, need to make sure. Um, we have somewhere in the Jabba session, um, so we should be able to use Jabba. And we are going to try and watch the queue. Um, other things you can help with. Um, we're always looking for reviewers for working group drafts. We have a number of drafts that are coming up to a working group last call. Please look for these. Please review those. But please also take a chance to review any other documents you find being discussed um, or just appearing on the list. Um, reviews are what makes this process work. Please volunteer reviews. If you're in any doubt, contact one of the chairs and we'll help you. But we always appreciate people to review. If you're thinking about providing a draft to this working group, please ensure minus TSVWG minus appears in the draft name. And then we'll spot it in the tracker and we will call upon you. 
Uh, for the moment, we're going to focus this meeting not on individuals' drafts, but on the main working group items, uh, because it makes it slightly simpler to run the interim, and we need to focus on getting the working group items moving towards completion. Next slide, please. Yeah. David, do you want to talk about the ones you shepherded? Oh, speaking of completed working group items, um, we now have three RFCs on the uh, uh, extensions to the forward error correction framework uh, to, uh, to, to accommodate uh, uh, the, the uh, RLC coding. Um, RFC numbers are there. Vincent has been very patient. It's been a long adventure. They're out. Um, Let's see, that gobbledygook in the middle of the slide is announcing that the infamous WebRTC cluster 238 is about to enter Auth48, which means our one draft as part of that cluster and has been lingering in the RFC editor queue is going to pop out and get published sometime, sometime soon. Um, beyond that, we don't yet have any more net drafts in RFC editor queue, but um, we're about to start working on uh, changing that. Slide. Okay. Uh, datagram uh, uh, PMTUD uh, is in IESG review. The three IDs with working group chairs and authors after working group last call are 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 all mine for some reason. Uh, the first two drafts, ECN encapsulation for lower layer protocols and ECN for tunnels that use shim headers. We have rough consensus on the list as to what the fragmentation text needs to say. Uh, Bob needs to find the copious spare time to write it. I need to find the copious spare time to review it. Uh, the drafts will be revised. The crucial thing is these drafts have to align with RFC 3168 ECN uh, requirements on reassembly, and then we can separately uh, decide whether we want to rev uh, 3168 to, uh, to improve that. Um, this should be a text exercise. Transfer confidentiality impacts. Uh, yours truly a shepherd thinks we are getting close to done with the text bashing. Uh, with luck, we're gonna have one more rev of this draft that will finally bash the text, insert the mentions of whatever else needs to be mentioned. And then I will, I will write up the shepherd report and make this Martin's problem. Next slide. Uh, are we talking about this? Um, the uh, the transfer confidentiality, uh, we're not going to talk about it here. Uh, I prefer that the detailed text bashing continue on the list. I believe we're down to, to, to fairly low level text bashing. Uh, I don't agree with that characterization. Uh, who's speaking? This is Eric or Squirrel. Understood. And Eric, what's going to happen is that um, your objection to publication of this draft will be included will be included explicitly in the Shepherd report. Uh, please raise it again at IETF last call. That will be the place to deal with it. If that's how you want to roll. That is how I want to roll. Rough consensus occasionally requires calling people in the rough. Sorry to have to do it to you. Uh, I do, I, okay, I don't agree with your call of rough consensus, but I suppose you can take it IETF last call. It's going to, I, I, I would prefer that that issue be bashed, be bashed IETF last call, please. Okay, next slide. Do a consensus call, actually. No, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry to be difficult, but are you actually going to do a consensus call on this um, and, and take and take and take and take yeses or nos? Because I, I haven't seen you do that since our objections were raised. Do an announcement to the list of what's going to go into the Shep to, to, to the Shepherd report, which includes sending sending um, uh, your your views on the draft and David Skenazi's views on the draft to I to I to uh, IETF last call, which I think is the more appropriate form to work to, uh, to work those out. Uh, I guess I don't agree with that process. The right, appropriate process is to actually run, run a poll. Um, that that seems to run afoul of the we don't of, of we don't do voting. I guess we can take it off offline, but I don't agree. That's not, that's not how I've seen it run. Okay, happy, 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 take it off, take it offline. Um, I believe the appropriate form, form to continue on continue on those concerns is IETF last call. Leave this group consensus to do so. Okay, Gore, you want to cover RTO consider? 
Yeah, I can cover RTO Consider. RTO Consider is a TCPM work item. Um, it's about um, architecting the RTO timer in TCP, uh, but has evolved to give wider guidance on um, setting um, backstop timers in transport protocols in general. So this TCPM work item is relevant here. Um, we worked with Mark Holman, the main author, when we did the UDP guidelines some while ago. Um, so the working group has already published a document that is supposed to be consistent with this uh, more detailed document. Um, I would recommend that you read it. Uh, please send um, discussion of this to TCPM. It's a joint working group last call. And they would love to hear feedback. Next one, IDs like to go to working group last call soon. Um, we'll hear a bit about these later. Um, we have two drafts which have been around for quite a while relating to SCTP. One has been around for as long as I can remember, uh, which is the NAP support document. And I believe that's pretty near finished now. Um, expect a working group last call of that very soon. There's also the SCTP base update. This is mainly an update of the text of the spec to include the errata. It's not intended as a major change to SCTP in any way. Uh, please review it in that, with that thinking that this is not intended to be a major change, but it is an uh, important time to clean up the spec and complete the wording in there so that it's a, a good solid spec. Um, there are comments still to be put into the next rev, and then we'll do a working group last call of that. Um, when we come to those two items in the meeting shortly, I'll be asking for people to volunteer to review these. The L4S drafts are going to be discussed in the second interim meeting, so we'll come to those um, later rather than today. Next slide. These then are the list of working group IDs which are currently with the working group. Um, NAT support, SCTP base spec, the three L4S drafts, uh, the non-Q building PHB draft, UDP options, and the tunnel congestion feedback. There are a number of individual drafts which um, are mentioned on this slide. In fact, there are more than this, but this just calls out some of those individual drafts which are waiting currently in the sidelines to enter TSVWG. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these on the list. Use the list to talk about them. We're interested in hearing your thoughts on these drafts. There are two drafts at the top which I'd like to just call out. Um, the SOX protocol is an int area document. Um, as far as I know, it's proceeding in int area in the absence of the Vancouver meeting. Um, at some point, this will be a working group last called with this working group um, because SOX is something that is not just interior, it's the binding between the interior and putting two interior pipes together. So um, it's something that's relevant to TSVWG. And they're looking to us for the transport clue to review that document. The second document, the reassignment of system ports to the IESG, um, is a non-working group internet draft. It was put forward to proposed changes to the IANA process for the system ports. Um, as it went through the IETF last call process, um, a number of different things appeared, and this document is going to be recycled and revised and a decision made on the document to proceed. It's not a TSVWG work item, but it is close to some of the stuff that TSVWG has done in the past, so um, it may be useful to read the next revision of this draft um, and give feedback to the authors, please. I see Bob in the mic queue. Bob, what did you want to comment on? You're talking on mute. Uh, I just wanted to ask on the previous slide that I noticed tunnel congestion feedback. Um, what's happening to it? It doesn't seem to have been updated for ages. Is it? still alive? Are the authors still alive? 
It's still alive. It's uh, going to be used by uh, an SF uh, an SFC draft. And last time I was paying attention, uh, it was pretty much on hold uh, for that SFC draft to make progress. To be revived, I think, is a fair summary. Lori, I think you're on mute now. Yeah, it's good to be on mute. Uh, we've been working through our revised working group milestone. Um, Top one is in red. It should have happened. Uh, we just heard about. We will, we will hear about that shortly. Um, the uh, next one is the April 2020 for um, the header encryption and confidentiality. This is one that's probably ready um, to progress to the next level of review. Uh, PLPMTUD has been submitted to the IESG and should be on the telechat tomorrow. SCTP NAT due to be finished in April. We may yet finish this in April and make a working group last call for that. Next up will be Joe's work on transport options for UDP. Um, this is something that Joe's revising. I'm not aware that Joe is going to make a presentation at the meeting. Um, he is about to put in a set of revisions to deal with the, a queue of things that have been asked since the last IETF, and he'll produce a new revised ID. So I don't know whether we'll meet the June deadline or not, but um, certainly by June the thing should be in a pretty good shape. Um, next one was one of yours. David, do you want to comment uh, on what's that? Going to hap yeah, what's happening here is the, for some reason, uh, we accidentally got the milestones separated. Uh, in practice, the draft at the top of the screen, the Easting Encapsulation Guidelines and the draft at the bottom, the 6040 update, uh, are paired, and uh, they will be revised together and sent off to the, I to the IESG together. Um, next month or so, uh, um, uh, all other things permitting. Okay, next slide. This is it. Okay, uh, milestones two. Um, the SCTP BIS protocol we'll hear about. We think that's in good shape. The three L4S drafts have a targeted milestone of October 2020, and the NQB PHB is a little bit further out. That might actually be finished early. It'd be nice to be finished early. Uh, the bottom one, I don't really have hope at the moment of finishing early. Um, it's still a work in progress. Next slide. So this is the agenda we've put together for our remote meeting um, that we're currently in. Uh, now is the time to say if you want to add something to this agenda or you think there's something missing. Um, We've done the note well. Uh, we've done most of our announcements and heads up. We're going to say a little bit about the plan for the second interim. I expect that to be Wes. Um, hopefully he does too. Um, we then uh, go to the SCTP draft, the transport working group drafts on protocols, and a couple of individual drafts that are looking for some guidance by the working group. Um, these two drafts, um, need a home. So uh, we'll be interested in knowing your views on whether they're uh, interesting material to work upon. Um, we don't have on the agenda Bob's slide deck. I just sipped it in as 2.1 in the meeting materials. Do we want to show that? Other chairs? Yeah, I'm fine. If Bob wants to show that, we can hand the presentation all over to him. Okay, is that the last slide of our? Oh, we want to do the next agenda slide, I think. 
Um, this is the agenda for the second interim. Uh, this is a little bit further out, and the interim's in on Monday, the 27th of April. And we're going to focus this particular interim just on the L4S and ECN topic, particularly focusing in on ECT1 usage. We've prepared a example set of slides for this, which we're going to use to get contributions from the L4S advocates and the SCE advocates. And we're going to put together a joint presentation in which we will expect the different um, parties to each present their own position. And we'll then be able to hopefully ask for some working group feedback on what to do next on trying to agree the decisions that we need to make, and then perhaps trying to make some of those decisions. The chair's summary of position is, is the hope at the end that we actually get somewhere with the ongoing discussion that's been had in the working group. Is there anything else you want to add to that, David? No, wish us well. Okay, so recap, um, if you haven't yet done so, there are blue sheets available in Etherpad. Please make sure you do sign in. If you can use Jabber, uh, we can use Jabber for remote chat. I see some Jabber going on in the main WebEx chat because more people are joined there. We'll try and make this work. If you do want to talk at the mic, make sure you put plus Q into the main WebEx chat. I think that's our last slide. Bob, would you like to prepare a short update of your um, shim slides? Just take a few minutes just to type, take us quickly through that. I can do that, yeah. Um, just so it tells people what the status is, yeah. Do you want to present the slides? I can make you a presenter. Uh, probably best not, as I'm on, on a limping um, uh, broadband link via my mobile phone via um, a strange mast and various other things. Sure. I uploaded them in the proceedings. Thanks. I did copy the link to the list, so if people can't have Um, am I meant to be able to see them yet, or is they? Wes, can you remove? I, I do not have. Uh, I do not have easy access to a copy of them. So. Uh, you, okay. I'm working, on, I'm, I'm working on it. Give 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 me give me thirty seconds. Okay, I will uh, make you the presenter in the meantime. Um. <laughs> Um, wait. Let's see if link to the slides in the um, chat. Okay. Um, done this right, you see Bob's first slide. Yep. Good. Okay. Um, so, this is, there's really two drafts that this affects, and it was a comment from Joe Touch during the working group last call to say, what about um, fragmentation and reassembly in tunnels? The drafts are primarily about tunnels, not fragmentation and reassembly. And as um, David has pointed out, and I've pointed out, um, the, the two are often often come together, but they're, they're orthogonal. So anyway, let's next slide, please, Wes. So the top level, point here is that um, RFC 3168 already mentions um, what to do about reassembly um, and essentially aims to preserve the time of each CCN mark. Um, as you see here, there's um, a, an attempt to show eight fragments being turned into four packets um, and the red crosses are meant to be ECN marks. And if either or both of the fragments have an ECN mark, the um, resulting packet is meant to have one, 
as per 3168. And the um, logic behind that was to attempt to um, preserve the time and Jonathan in particular has been arguing that um, AQMs like HODL control the time between marks um, and that's why the, that's correct and the argument I've been um, putting with and I've got a couple of examples to show it is that um, HODL doesn't aim for a specific time between marks, it just uses time and and then, and then it adjusts the time um, until it balances. And so there's no, um, it's no particularly different um, process to adjusting probability, it just adjusts a thing and, and it happens to use time. And so the actual time between the marks isn't special. Um, and actually, as you'll see in the next example, it um, causes unfairness to try and um, preserve the mark um, time between the marks. Um, the I'm going to... Yeah, at the time so, sorry, RFC 368 was written, uh, the primary yeah. goal was not to lose congestion marks. Yes, yes. And and preserving the time when they happen is another way of saying not losing them. <clears throat> yep. Um, I'm going to get to the end of, of how this affects these drafts, but I just wanted to um, give some background to what the debate is. Um, so this is the first example. Um, the top shows a couple of sources and destinations. In other words, of um, two flows going through, um, as it happens, a tunnel. But this could just be fragmentation generally. Um, and this tunnel happens to have an MTU of 1,500 bytes. One flow is um, running just below that, so that when the headers are added, it doesn't need to fragment. The other is running at 1500 bytes, so when the headers are added, it does need to fragment. And um, in this case, it's a V4 tunnel, so it's um, the tunnel is fragmenting. Um, so you end up with twice as many packets in the lower flow. I'm looking at the top um, picture, uh, top half of this picture. Um, so with a certain percentage marking, say 0.2%, um, over a thousand packets per second, you get four marks per second for the second flow. That means, uh, and the way um, 3168 does the reassembly, we're assuming this is 3168 reassembly, that means you end up with twice as many um, marks coming out the other end, even though you've got the same packet rate once you put all the fragments back together into packets. Then the, um, the lower half shows that TCP will respond to those and it will end up um, going about a quarter of the rate of the other flow. So that, that looks like it's a problem. Um, and it's, it's, it comes from this idea that you need to preserve all the marks. If I now show the second example, this one uses a um, FQ scheduler as the AQM. So this time it forces the, the um, flows to all have the same rate. And um, because the scheduler forces that, and so effectively TCP reverse engineers the um, percentage marking AQM in the FQ scheduler to um, make sure that they all have equal rate. And I've shown three flows here, A, B, and C. Um, and one of them, uh, or the top one, is as on the previous slide, slightly smaller than 1500 bytes. The second one is the 1500 byte one that we had before, which gets fragmented. And the third one is a source that already um, makes its packets half, half the size of um, 1500 bytes, in other words, 750 bytes. So they don't need to be fragmented. And the um, top level point about this, without going all the way through it, is that um, it ends up that the FQ scheduler um, marks, the time between the marks um, depends on um, just what, what effectively what TCP is doing. So it adjusts until it gets the right time between the marks to make, make all the flow rates equal. But none of the times between marks, um, are, well, two of the times between marks are equal and one isn't. And in particular, when you look at the last two, the, the red um, words there, you've got 
um, one mark every 1.7 seconds in one and one mark every 6.7 seconds in the other. And yet they're both 2,000 packets per second. They're both 750 bytes. And the AQM doesn't actually know that one of those, uh, the packets are fragments and the others aren't. It never looks at whether they're fragments or not. It's just marking packets in, uh, that happen to be inside a tunnel. So that, that looks like something seriously wrong. Um, and um, so the the upshot of that is um, we've, uh, we've got to sort that out. Um, so what we'll do in these um, this update shim draft and the ECNN cap guidelines draft is just say um, that fragmentation and reassembly is out of scope. These are about tunneling and fragmentation and reassembling assembly is um, orthogonal to that. Um, we will mention that 3168 discusses ECM fragmentation and reassembly, but we won't give it as a normative reference. Um, it will be an informative reference. And um, we'll update 3168 fragmentation and reassembly separately if, um, uh, and that will be a draft that has to be adopted and all the rest of it, and it'll be a short one if it is to um, update 3168 um as a probably standard track draft and that's it okay cool all right is that the process you you believe david i believe that's a process and i believe that we've pretty much agreed on slightly longer descriptions of the um of the mention RFC 3168 discusses ECN frag and reassembly text on the list. It's a little bit tricky to write because you essentially essentially want to say that um, you got if you want to figure out how to do it now, go see 3168. We want to do that without using um, a uh, a must or should keyword, given that we're going to get to debate that in the context of that separate short draft and last bullet of the slide. But that that's the plan. We think it works. Yep. Okay. So, Bob, presumably you're also going to go right here. So, Bob, presumably you're going to also um, pay some attention to the interior documents by Ron Boniker, et cetera that talk about fragmentation or whether it's a good idea in the first place. I think those documents become important in the context of the, yeah, of, the, of the, the separate.
we get to debate this all in the context of the next draft, for which we don't even have a dash zero, a dash zero zero yet. Jonathan, and hopefully last comment because we need to move on to the rest of the agenda. Oh, he just he, he just DQ'd himself. That's even easier. All right. Um, what is next, gentlemen? Ladies and gentlemen. Ah. CTP. CTP yes. Uh, are you around, Michael? Michael, are you in the room? Excellent. Would you like to take the the floor and tell us about SCTP BIS? Yes. What has to be done still? Um, reviewed the document and um, provided a list of issues, um, which are, uh, well, editorials might, might be not the right term, but look at uh, text changes, something like that, in a detailed way. So I have to go through this and um, address these. Uh, most likely, I will um, put in a revision um, when that's done. And then uh, another format change has to happen. Um, originally 4960 was written in XML. Um, the ROC editor changed it back to NROF. When I got it for the BIS, I converted NROF to V2 of the XML in a very strange way to preserve the NROF formatting and then it will uh, be reformatted to V3 and I will take out all the um, hacks to make it look like uh, NROF stuff. So um, that should be done. And then you, I guess you will see um, formatting and white space changes. So the diff tool on the text will not be very nice to look at. Um, and to address any other further comments. So that's the, uh, that's the plan for the document. Sounds good. Michael, quick check. Uh, do you have a short summary of changes from 4960 in this draft? No, we have a, we have a whole RFC about this. It's the SCTP errata, which is old style, new style. Uh, old text, new stack, new text. It describes exactly the changes between 4960 and 4960 bis. Understood. It might be, might be helpful to implementers to have a TLDR summary uh, in this in this draft of important stuff that has changed, I guess that those important changes are really DPLP, MTUD, and a couple of erratas that occurred since um, we did that other document. So this should be very short. 
Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, of if you're an implementer and want to understand in 30 seconds how this how this draft matters to your 4960 implementation here are the top top three, five, whatever uh, things you need to know. Including the changes from the errata RFC. Yeah, including that as a pointer, Mark. Uh, I don't. I don't think Michael. I'm expecting. Oh, okay. Then okay. you pa you paste that in. So I'm expecting a very small section somewhere which says the changes between four nine six zero base and this are documented here in this RFC. Um, additionally, there are two bullets, three bullets, whatever of changes. Okay, understood. I would also put in perhaps three or four bullets of the errata changes that actually affect implementations as opposed to the ones that were just uh, text cleanup. But they all have errata, I think, David. I understand they're all errata. It's just, it's just that, that the errata RFC is enormous. And I'm looking for a real short summary of if you're an implementer and you're trying to update from 4960 to this uh, BIS RFC, what are the top things you need to pay attention to? I'll, I guess I'll work with Michael and we'll sort this. It's not, it, okay. it, it, my, it, it shouldn't be a lot of work. Uh, my, my list of comments on the work in progress line are, just for complete transparency, is going through every use of an RFC 2119 keyword and checking that the, um, the text there is completely watertight. Um, a couple of places there are, um, it's and they's that refer to other parts of the document, which um, I just wanted to t tone and make sure that they were completely clear. Um, so I, I suspect this um, shouldn't raise questions, but if they do, I guess Michael will discuss them on the list as usual. Yep, they do. When do you think you can do my long list of checks and your, your conversion from V2 to V3 and have the whole thing ready for a last call? Um. By the next IETF, if it happens, I mean, <laughs> what is it? End of Ju end of uh, July, or what? What is the time frame there? I mean, the time frame for the next IETF that would be, I guess, when this. I guess that sounds good. That, ready. that sounds good, and um, by that time, we will need reviewers for this document. So. If you're a person who's been reading this, as soon as Michael posts the V2 to V3 conversion, we'd love people to go through and find the form, and we'd love people to volunteer to do that in the working group last call. So um, as soon as that second revision is published, we're looking for people to read that text and check it in detail. Any other questions to, to this draft? Then you get to talk about not. Yes. Next slide. So um, the version revision fifteen was the revision which the author authors thought is that the document is ready. Um, um, there came up uh, the uh, suggestion to include a Yang module um, and. That was provided by Mohammed, and um, it was included. Um, the um, XML sources were converted from V2 to V3, so I used this document as an exercise to do this conversion. Um, and we had some comments from Maxim, um, a lot of comments from Maxim. I um, tried to address them, and the result is revision 16. Um, next slide. So um, this is the current state. Um, we have editorial comments from Gori, which are fine. So it's um, no discussion, no discussion required. Um, Maxim has. We have reduced the number of issues he has with this document. Um, we have one issue where uh, Maxim. Um, once something else as it is written in the document and it's about um, if we have a net 
um, and we have two clients behind the NAN ad um, establishing an association to the same server uh, using the same port. Um, and there is a collision in port numbers and the verification tag. Then the current document says the netbox must send an abort to the client such that, and it's indicating that this abort comes from the middle box and it indicates why it's, it's the case. So the SCDP stack can by itself um, reissue a new init with a new verification tag and hopefully resolve this collision. Um, and uh, Maxim wants that the must, which is now there, becomes a should because he wants to build uh, nets in a simpler way, in a, in a, basically in a way that they don't need to send packets. So the drawback is that in this case, the net would just drop the packet. Uh, the end node would have to run into timeouts um, multiple times. And then the what the stack does is give, uh, give an indi uh, indication to the application um, and then the application has to re-trigger another association setup. And that's something I don't like, so that's the, 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 the technical thing. Any preferences there? So I would like to make the life most simple for the application. He wants to allow this for a net and if if I'm an application and I don't know what the net does, I have to deal with the, with the timeouts. So what is, is any comments on that? Sorry, I've got a couple of comments. What, what, what do any implementations of this nut do? I know one implementation and I guess that is doing send the abort. That send the abort. Yeah, I thought so. Um, that implementation follows the, I mean, that implementation is built based on this specification, so that's why it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. What, does, does anybody in the working group have opinions on this? This is David, I have a question. Okay. What yep. happens if the NAT sends the abort and the abort is dropped? Uh, then the endpoint retransmits the init and it triggers another abort. And if that is dropped again and again and again, after 10 times, the application, uh, the association goes down. But I suggest you write up roughly what you just described in terms of, of what the implementation is going to have to do if the abort is dropped or if the abort is repeatedly dropped. And then in that context, uh, it, we might be able to, to, to take a sharper look at whether, whether sending the abort is a must or a should. Okay. I would actually support David's line of thinking um, and suggest you propose to the working group some text which says, if this is a should, this is the reason why you should do it. Um, I'm a little bit interested in looking at both options here because um, having a must for something which doesn't <coughs> require the protocol mechanism to retransmit it from the NAT isn't reliable, so the must isn't really that helpful because you, you inject a packet that may or may not finally reach the endpoint. Yeah, I okay. want to see how bad the downside is before I weigh in on must versus should. And I, th I think though we're, we're, we're sort of in, in some form of rough, rough agreement that writing up the downside of, of, of the abort not arriving is important to do. Okay, I will do that. The other comments are editorial and I can resolve them with Maxim. Um, Mohamed et also has not only um, suggested um, uh, the uh, Yang model, he also su suggested uh, some comment. Uh, he also had some comments. Um, most of them have been integrated. Um, two uh, are not integrated yet. And one is, uh, I also need some sort of uh, advice. Um, we talk about net devices in that document. Uh, and this is done in RFC 2663 and RFC 4787. Um, and uh, Mohamed suggests to use net function because that's the term used in RFC 6888. And there are even other documents which use simply net 
in the sense of uh, so being an acronym not for network address translation but using it as an acronym for network address translator so what should we do i don't care i just i would suggest sticking with nat device and then it, uh, putting the explanation you just gave about other terminology being used in other places into the draft and saying we're using that device because we need we needed a term here. Okay, that makes sense. Yep, and call, call it out explicitly early. J just okay. say in this document we talk about a NAT device. Other places might talk simply about a NAT or, or implement this for a NAT function and cite the appropriate RFC for NAT function. Okay. Med is in the queue. That will yes. be good to hear. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I personally, I, I don't care. I don't have any. I would say it's the, um, the the comment is really minor. You just pick the one which is, I, I would say, your your favorite one, and and then to be consistent with the, I would say, uh, through the document, it will just go to, I would say, the the use of device uh, is that for people will implicitly mention that is something which is really, I would say, hardware. Why we are mainly dealing with with with, I would say, with the software component. That's the um, the initial comment. Uh, but more basically, uh, actually, one of the comments they would like that you, um, you you would cover, I would say, in in the new version was about the fragmentation. Because, for instance, in your document, you you mandate to have, I would say, the fragmentation to be must be, um, I would say, the reassembly must be supported by the NAT device itself. Uh, this is not something that we have today for all the, I would say, the the NAT flavors we have in in the in the field. With only one exception about the NAT64, which requ requires to do the reassembly. So I think that you need to have more discussion on that part to to have the implication of having the I would say the the NAT function itself to do the assembly, how the memory will be I would say um, controlled, etc. There's a lot of I would say uh, complications to to do that on on that device, the checksum configuration and so on. So I, I, I would I would I would tell so the fragmentation for me is more important than the I would say the terminology one. Uh, so uh, I would like you um, that if. This is possible that you can you can cover that in the next version with more attention. I can try to. Um, okay. Um, so, so Michael or Med or whoever, um, what should we do with fragmented packets? Um, SCTP kind of expects the IP layer to help with its fragmentation. It, one of the functions in the SCTP spec. So we could write and explain that this is something that's important, or you could just allow a NAT to break, not send these packets, in which case you will get datagram drops. Is that what we're talking about? <laughs> so if, if I get a, if, 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 if a NAT box gets a packet, it gets a fragment and has to make the decision to which internal node it's being forwarded, um, it must look up the association. So um, that's why we currently say um, it must do um, reassembly, and then it knows what to do, and then it can process it. So I guess the question to you, Michael, is what happens if the NAT is a small device or a function which is limited in terms of its memory and doesn't want to do sort of reassembly work? Um, Do we just say this can't implement the spec? Well, it can implement the spec, but um, if for whatever reason SCTP has to fragment packets or some other node fragments the packets, uh, they are dropped. And uh, for in some scenarios, uh, SCP can't recover from that. So there are scenarios where SCTP relies on IP fragmentation and reassembly to be working. I think this is, like the this is another chunk of sure. functionality that simply need that that that, that needs needs to be explained. That if you don't do this, the following bad things happen. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, how, oh, Magnus. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, Magnus Westland. I just wonder how does this relate to actually uh, path and two discovery requirements? Yeah, it's okay. Um, if you do path MTU, oh, if Michael can answer this, why am I talking? Yeah, so if you so path MTU discovery helps you to if if uh, the 
MTU drops, you will figure that out and you will adopt. But in SCTP, if you have sent a packet which is larger than the path MTU, because for example, the path MTU was for some reason shrank, um, SCTP might not be able to re uh, fragment the pa to to re build the packet in a smaller way. So it, then it relies on a small amount of time for fragmentation and reassembly to work. Once it's learned, it has learned that the MTU went down, it adopts the packet construction to that, but it can't, for example, if a user message is broken up in data chunks, it can't redo this. Okay. Problematic then, yeah. Okay, then I have no more <laughs> input ethics. So. Okay, next slide. And that's already resolved. So um, Mohamed also wanted uh, that we don't use um, public address for the address uh, on the external side of the net. Uh, we use external side, and then um, we change the, uh, the the terminology for the for the other endpoint from external to remote, and that's consistent. And he's uh, fine with it. And so I will change that. So that's the stuff which has to change in the document and plus the IP fragmentation thing plus the um, must versus should. Terminology change. This terminology change is good. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, when might you be able to do all this again? in the next shorter period or longer period? Uh, let me try to do it in, within the next four weeks. Excellent, I like that a lot. Thank you. Greg, would you like to talk about NQB? Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Great. Um, so this is a brief update on the status of the NQB draft. Um, Go on to the next slide. We, uh, yeah, so this um, instead of just the recent history, is this draft was adopted by the working group uh, shortly after IETF 105. Um, and my co author and I uh, published the draft 00 in November last year um, with some. Really significant restructuring of the draft from the original draft, uh, original uh, individual draft, um, uh, into a format that um, is closer to um, the format of other PHP specs. Um, and also in the process, addressed most of the comments that had been made during the, the ITF 105 meeting and on the mailing list around that time. Um, there was one set of comments that uh, we we didn't tackle on that uh, draft zero zero, which was relating to interoperability with uh, Wi-Fi and especially Wi-Fi multimedia or EDCA, um, and that was uh, work that then followed after draft zero. So draft one, which we just published, um, I guess about a month ago now. Um, uh, rewrote that Wi-Fi interoperability section, introduced some new requirements to provide safeguards. Um, there were some concerns, the concerns were around um, the potential for in Wi-Fi, the NQB code point to um, uh, be treated in a way that's not, uh, that doesn't comply with the, with the PHP requirements. So it, it actually gives it priority over uh, best effort um, or default this sort of code point, uh, which was, uh, you know, the, the NQB draft has a requirement of not uh, introducing a, a priority difference between the two. Um, and, and so um, a number of, of safeguards were added to the Wi-Fi section and, and some recommendations on configuration of EDCA in order to eliminate that, uh, uh, those, those issues. There are also a few editorial changes that um, we took care of in draft 01, um, but uh, uh, that's that's now been published for a month, so hopefully folks have had a chance to look at that. And if the Wi-Fi improbability concern was one that you had, um, 
please take a look at that, that new, uh, newly written section and let us know if you have any uh, comments or suggestions on that. Uh, remaining work to do, a um, uh, couple of items relating to um, uh, uh, detail in the draft around um, uh, operation in certain situations. So first one being uh, existing DFCP remarking pathologies. Um, uh, uh, there have been some studies in the not too distant past about um, uh, ways that DIFs or code points are, are manipulated or mangled um, in transit and uh, um, not in the kind of common way of just bleaching to zero, but, but actually um, modification of, of particular bits in the, in the DIFs or field. And so some discussion of the potential impact that that might have on NQB, uh, NQB treatment is needed. Secondly, um, there are a number of shoulds in the draft, and um, we don't provide much detail on uh, with the ramifications of not complying with those shoulds. I think a couple of them we do, but several of them we don't, so um, a little bit of work there. And then lastly, um, on the slide here, a further alignment with uh, PHB spec guidelines provided in RFCs 2474, 2475. I've got a little bit of detail on the next slide that shows what's left to do on that. Before you go to the next slide, Greg, this is David. One more work item, which uh, I'm going to assign to myself as Shepard, uh, and that is uh, this would be a good time since we're approaching completion to recheck uh, the selection of the default uh, default DSCP for for this PHB, and that um, uh, I think that's my responsibility, Shepard, uh, to uh, to kick that discussion off on the list. Okay, thank you. Uh, one other item actually that uh, I, I didn't make into the slide is there's still a question of uh, should versus must on what the requirements, and that's the requirement for traffic protection, or what we originally called queue protection. Um, so some further discussion needs to happen to, uh, to finalize that one. Yeah, and in particular, that one's going to be a, a bifurcated, well, I'm sorry, not bifurcated. It's going to be a two-part discussion because um, it's going to have to talk about both uh, what is the requirement for implementation and what is the requirement for the the, the, um, the requirement for usage. I have an opinion on this, and I will refrain from uh, diving into that rat hole right now. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. that thank you. Um, so next slide then. Um, so I went through the the guidelines um, in RC twenty four seventy five um, twenty four seventy four also had um, some guidelines, but they were fairly high level and I think largely covered by the more detailed set in 2475. So we'll listen them out here. Um, um, many of these we, um, I think, have already taken care of. There are three I highlighted that we definitely need to do some work on. Um, and then there are a few that uh, um, are close, but uh, maybe don't exactly comply with uh, the expectations, like, for example, putting things into, into appendices rather than having them in the main body of the, the draft. Um, David, again, on G11, config and management issues, traffic protection, configuration and management definitely is part of that. Okay. All right, noted. And that is it for my update. So, um, we do plan to um, continue work on the draft and ideally have it in good shape for um, transitioning to working group last call really soon, um, hopefully by the next ITF meeting. Sounds good. Any other comments or questions? Is Mike not still in the queue? Magnus said his bid on the earlier topic, so I think we're moving on. <laughs> okay. Um, I, uh, from my point of view, I'd be interested in picking out the um, the disk of call point selection um, as a separate topic on the email list, and let's try and confirm that we've got the right disk of call point and it works in the right way. 
uh, it seems like something that's orthogonal to the specification of the PHP, so we could probably separately call that out on the list and just get some people to see whether we all agree with the analysis, and then perhaps even we can um, provisionally allocate that DSCP to this document. I agree. I need to start that discussion. That would be good. Thank you. Thank you. Now we move to Martin. Martin, would you like to change your hat and join us uh, in the blue box on the floor? I think. I'm probably <laughs> guilty for bringing this here, so I'll, I'll do a little bit of a prelude. Um, this working group used um, to not do NAT stuff because we had a behave working group. Um, then the behave working group did the clever thing of closing and asking where did all the work go, and the answer was the work came to TSVWG, which is fine. Um, then suddenly we end up with a new transport. Um, so do we need a document about QUIC and how it works with relation to the BEHAVE document? Do we need guidance for this? Should it be done here? Should it be done somewhere else? Um, I guess that's what we're now going to hear about. Over to you, Martin. Yes, good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, this is a very short document uh, that actually, as Gordy suggests, was originated in a discussion that we had, I think, in Singapore. Um, <clears throat> next slide. It, it's very slot, it's very short, and this is the even shorter version of it. Um, basically, if you were a NAT designer and you see this connection kind of IE thing, it might sound cool to leverage that in some way. But in fact, that's bad. So just treat it like a UDP connection. Next slide. Um, this is one example of a superficially attractive thing. If you are facing port exhaustion, you could, in theory, you, uh, multiplex multiple quick connections over the same address port combination by just using the CID. Uh, unfortunately, the CID can change in mid connection. Uh, through you know, message exchange inside the crypto, which the net can't see, and then you would just black hole the connection, which is obviously not good. Far better to just refuse the connection in the first place than, than to uh, create a black hole in, in mid-flow. In mid Next slide. So uh, going the other side, um, one thing that we are facing in quick community is that uh, some routing architect architectures and data centers uh, route based on the five tuple, um, so that if there's any sort of address change, whether it be a NAT rebinding or, or a, a intentional migration, um, the packet will end up at some other server. So there's a lot of work to kind of solve this problem. Um, one, one thing, someone might try to be quote unquote helpful and have the NAT monitor the connection IDs and then um, if there is a NAT rebinding that changes the address, simply rewrite the source address to allow it to route correctly back to the correct server. Um, well, number one, this won't work if the connection ID changes, so it eliminates um, the, the intentional migration case. But secondly, um, when there is any sort of address report change, there's a um, there's a whole process to validate that it's a correct that it's a um, accurate that that is in fact something that the that the is an actual change in the address of the client and not some sort of hijack attempt. And um, all those mechanisms occur in the crypto. And if you mask that from the end server, then it's not going to be able to perform all those checks. That's kind of creating security vulnerability. Next slide. So this has not received a ton of review. It's sitting as an individual draft and quick. Uh, I'm not, frankly, desperate for this to make it up to RFC or what, ha what have you. Um, I think there's a, a number of possible outcomes. Um, we could take this text and just put it in the quick operations draft. The quick operations draft is you know, fairly mature. It's also quite long. And I think one of the objections to doing that is that um, people don't read long documents. Uh, another option would be just to have this thing live forever as an expired individual draft and have the quick ops draft just link to it as an informational reference for some background, just put in a the TLDR version in the ops draft and point to this for further discussion. We could make it a standalone RFC if, if, if people have the energy for that, or we just drop this because it's just not really important. 
thing to document. Um, so again, I, I'm open to reviews and I'm open to input on what, what we should do with this. Borrowing a phrase oft used by the uh, AD whose seat uh, uh, you have taken, it sounds like the overall purpose here is to prevent uh, the bad idea fairy from visiting NAT implementers. And a standalone published RFC would be a good step in that direction. Mira, you're at next in queue, I think. Yeah, I think we should definitely, no matter what happens to this document, add something to the um, manageability draft a quick and point to this document. Um, at that point, I don't really care about anymore if this is an, an own RC or just an expired draft. Um, I'm also fine having it in an I, I, um, RC, but it should definitely be mentioned in the manageability draft. I, I think you're right. I think the manageability document has to include this. Then the question is whether David's comment is is something that's important. In other words, will the NAT implementers read something short and go, aha, we won't take do that because that's a really bad idea. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Colin? Hi. Uh, I, I'm unconvinced that uh, NAT implements will necessarily read this, but I think we should write it uh, anyway. Um, because I think it's important to document what the right thing to do is, whether or not it has a whole lot of effect in practice. Um, I would also uh, suggest that this includes some some quite clear statements to remind people that not all UDP traffic is quick, um, and that's the you know that they should they should be aware that there are other types of UDP traffic still. That's interesting. Spencer? We're back around to me, right? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm plus one on the short standalone document. Uh, I think that that's the right thing to do. Um, I'm plus one on RFC uh, because I, I agree with the statement that was made that the net vendors aren't going to read this, but the net vendors are not the primary uh, intended audience, in my opinion. It's people who would be showing this to net vendors, um, who are who are the opposite of net vendors. Um, and uh, plus one on the mention of uh, of an ops area uh, of, the, of the ops uh, uh, management draft mentioning this. So I think I think that uh, you are all you are all queued up to do the right thing. This should be written in the style of what I've what is sometimes colloquially referred to uh, as a clue by four. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I I I had not thought about what uh, Colin said about uh, reminding people that um, that uh, not all UDP traffic is quick traffic. Um, I, and I, th I think I think that's a really good idea, and um, I think that will even be a really good idea if that's not true at some point in the future. <laughs> Thank you. So, Martin, you got some feedback from the working group, which sounded quite positive. Yep. And th th there's there's a couple of questions now which you have to kind of figure out. Um, the first one is you need to talk to the AD responsible for TSVWG to figure out whether it fits. Uh, in it's the kind of difficult. I don't know how it's going to go. Quick. <laughs> um, yep. I have to talk to the irresponsible lady for TSV working group. That's probably, that's probably wiser, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, I would yeah. expect if this, go, go, go ahead. I was just saying, here we go. <laughs> okay, thank you. If this goes ahead, um, I will give you the caution with tail since I'm currently wearing the hat. Um, we will have to coordinate closely with Quick. So it, um, it's not a matter of where, where you do this and, and, <laughs> and we ignore the other one. So it will have to be something that um, either the AD makes two chairs talk with together 
or the two chairs start talking. Um, so tell us what you would like to do next, Martin. Well, I think the feedback has been pretty uh, uniform. So I, I will pursue this. I I'll have a chat with Magnus about which working group this best lives in um, between Quick and here. And uh, I will take the comment and then Amira, Vera and I can work on uh, just getting a reference into the op quick ops draft. I mean, for the moment, we'll point to this, this ID and we'll see where it goes from there. And we'll need to, to work uh, whatever with. Whatever happens, please feel free to prod TSBWG for the extra inputs and other UDP traffic. Okay. And as this moves, if this moves forward in TSBWG, the TSBWG chairs will need to coordinate with the quick chairs. I I don't know that I saw any, any of the quick chairs on the uh, in on on the list. Um, so somebody probably need, needs needs to give them a heads up that, that we had this discussion. Martin, I think that might be you. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you ever so much for an exciting talk. Um, next talk will be oh Jerome. Jerome, are you online? And I, I am, although I'm through 15 mute buttons. <laughs> okay, maybe David could introduce the topic a little bit because this has a little bit of history with it, which probably should prelude your speaking and then go ahead after David's given an intro. So this draft has been floating around for a while now. Uh, it's on uh, uh, version two. 3GPP had a very negative reaction to this when it first appeared. Uh, we've had a, had some discussions with some of the 3GPP folks, and I think their view is no longer quite as negative, although we're still not, at least speaking, speaking as a chair, I think uh, not yet sure exactly what the purpose of this is, is and how to position it. And I believe um, the value of this draft intended audience, um, who's supposed to use it, how does it relate to the 3GPP standards is going to be the focus of what uh, Jerome's going to talk about. All right. Jerome. Thank you, David. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So let me give a little bit more context because, yeah, indeed, this is important. And you will see on the next slide um, why um, the um, first um, welcome was a bit cold on this on this draft. Uh, what we're looking at here is a case which starts to be emerging where a UE, a device, may have two concurrent paths um, through a network, one going through the 3GPP realm, um, you know, that's LTE, 5G, et cetera, you name it, um, and the other one is going through an unlicensed type of network, which is typically uh, relying on deep serve. So that could be, for example, a Wi-Fi connection. Uh, what we see from uh, implementers, and those are not carriers, and I think that's what not, was not clear in the first draft, uh, but are rather enterprises um, implementing a dual path for their devices, is that there is no clear uh, translation of the SLA and the intent that is expressed well uh, with the negotiation they have with their carriers to uh, the intent that could be expressed to translate the same uh, type of treatment over the deep surf domain. So in other words, you have some traffic going through the 3GPP domain, and typically what happens there is that there is a dialogue between an enterprise and a carrier by which they agree upon a certain type of treatment for a certain type of traffic and a certain type of devices. That is taken care of. But then if those devices uh, have two connections, one, for example, going also to Wi-Fi, what we see is that those uh, implementers, those enterprises, would like to, as much as possible, attempt to apply the same type of treatment, QoS treatment, on the leg that's going through the deep serve domain or the bottom leg that you see on the screen here, um, so that there is a higher chance that when this traffic reaches the enterprise or the cloud application that the enterprise is, is using, those uh, two legs uh, perform in ways that are somehow uh, somewhat comparable. Um, and this is difficult because the 3GPP uh, logic uses a system uh, which is relying on structure like QCI, QFI, 5QI, depending on, on the generation you talk about, which is much richer, I must say, that, uh, than the um, uh, DSCP values that we use uh, you know, based on RC4594, for example. 
So what we attempt to do in this draft is to offer um, mapping you know, structure that could allow those implementers to look at the uh, QCI and say, oh, QCI blah uh, seems to be matching intent blah. And this in deep surf seems to be matching what we could use as marking blah, the SCP value X, Y, Z. Um, in, as a matter of fact, we find that in many cases, uh, those QCIs are new enough um, that in the deep surf domain, we don't have the equivalent. Um, so what we did there was to try to uh, create a structure of mapping whenever possible, and whenever not possible, uh, conclude that the implementers would have to implement in the deep surf domain uh, probably some markings that would be new. Um, you know, concluding that there is no clear mapping that could be used from this uh, QCR logic into deep surf logic. Next slide, please. Um, so what we did um, initially in this draft zero and then draft one uh, was to uh, create that map. And as David mentioned, uh, the reception was um, lukewarm, if not cold from the 3GPP, uh, probably because our draft was not very clear on its intent. What we were um, doing was you know, creating a structure or a, a translation structure, but we were not very clear um, saying that this is not a sort of a teaching exercise for the 3GPP folks to know how they should translate their QCI into deep serve or how they should, you know, use uh, uh, this draft to uh, map the QCI getting deep serve marking. That was fairly unclear. In fact, you know, the draft itself was not any uh, clear on any of those uh, those framework environments. Also, um, we didn't say if it was, you know, supposed to be something that could be suggested as, as a possibility and would be in the informational track, or if that would be a standard track, you know, making it mandatory every time that would happen. Um, so, you know, the reception was called and we understood very well why. So we worked on draft number two, uh, where we tried to make the context much clearer. And of course, we were um, intending to, pre uh, to present that at, uh, at a past ATF that didn't happen in the face to face. Um, and also we had a third um, contributor that joined us uh, who helped us also add uh, some recommendations for 5G um, um, uh, QS elements, which are, you know, the QFI and 5QIs, uh, based, for example, on the uh, TS23501. Next slide, please. So uh, here we are today um, with uh, a set of possible recommendations, which are clearly um, uh, qualified as being informational. We do not need to, you know, to force this on anyone, uh, but because we have uh, multiple enterprises that implement with us, uh, either you know through the, the common uh, NHL vendors or you know through their own negotiation with NHL vendors, those dual connections. And as we see these uh, as growing, growing uh, permanently, we would like to you know offer you know the community a, a common way of seeing those mapping possibilities, uh, so that when they receive a QCI from you know the uh, 5G or LTE link, uh, they have an idea of how they would be treating. Um, the traffic going through the deep surf uh, domain uh, to try to match some intent which would be you know close if not you know entirely identical because I don't think it is entirely possible but at least close in intent uh, to what they will be uh, be receiving from the carrier side. Uh, so at this at this point you know what we would love to to see is people you know looking into this draft, um, providing comments first on whether this uh, framework that we specified is clear enough. Uh, to show that we're not, you know, dictating any m uh, mapping to anyone and certainly not, you know, talking to 3GPP, uh, asking them to do work, uh, but also help us see if the mapping we propose makes sense or not. In particular, you will see if you t take the time to read this, uh, that some of the maps are uh, asymmetric, which means that we have one DSCP that, you know, clearly maps the intent of a, of a QFI, uh, but when we go the other direction, we couldn't find the same intent on the, on the way back. So we have a bucket that falls well, but that bucket doesn't really fit the pipe to go the other direction. Uh, so we do have some cases where we have asymmetry in the mapping. It seems to us, you know, and the, um, the folks in my company working in the 3GPP who are more inverse than I am into the uh, uh, 3GPP logic behind this uh, QFI, QCI, um, that this is unavoidable. Uh, but, you know, intellectually, this is not very satisfying because we have this impression that things are not, that the pipe doesn't have the same uh, structure in both directions. So we would also love to get feedback on those uh, to see if anyone has issues with that asymmetry on if anyone has some uh, uh, recommendations on how these asymmetries would be solved if they need to be solved. And that's uh, pretty much where we are.
think there's a comment from Jake Holland in the mic queue. Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, have you considered trying to make it dynamic? I, I asked because I happened on a draft here. I will, since we have such a handy chat, I will paste it in the, um, in the uh, chat log here and, and also add it to the notes. Uh, I don't know if you will like this idea. And I, I haven't read your, drafts, uh, your draft with the mapping yet. Um, but there is, has been an effort active for some time to uh, make a way to communicate such services uh, across domain boundaries and to negotiate a marking for them. Uh, at, at the at at that boundary, uh, so I would encourage you to maybe take a look and consider whether there's a way to uh, do it that way. If, if the issue is that they I, don't I like, yeah, all right. Thanks. You go ahead. Sorry. Okay, thank you, Jacob. Yeah, I will. I will definitely. Um, I, I I know that um, uh, 3GPP um, supports 20, uh, RFC 2414. Uh, so there is this notion of DSCP that can be carried uh, within the uh, the, um, the the traffic. However, um, I also know that the um, a choice of the QCI QFI is a carrier uh, choice, you know, based on SLA. So um, there is not always a direct mapping between what the UE could be marking as uh, DSCP with what the carrier would be allocating as QS, uh, QFI, QCI. Um, but you know, uh, there's maybe definitely a way maybe to, to carry that information across the main. So I'll, I'll read that draft carefully. Thank you. I guess the, the chairs would be interested in feedback about whether you think the BGP community for QS marking draft in some way touches on what you're doing even if you are choosing a different approach because we should liaise with these people in the IETF if if they're doing something at least a little bit similar. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, just interested to know what you think about that. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I see Spencer in line. Um, I could you back up to the picture that had the network diagram on it? Be slide two, I think. I can start talking. Uh, it seemed like to me that one of the one of the things I wondered about when I saw this was when you're talking about three uh, GPP with you know home networks and. Um, and uh, visited networks and transit networks. Um, the um, it, we we may it, it is it your feeling that you may be going through a few of these unlicensed uh, network uh, or path legs. Yeah, that one. Thank you. Um, you see what you see what I'm saying. You mean Controlled by different uh, entities. Is that what you what you're thinking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it it may happen. Yeah, it's probably not the most common case we are facing. Sure. Um, but sure. It, it may happen. Sure. Yes. Yes. But, you know, as 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 people are doing the the uh, what oh god what, what's the three GPP thing where you are dropping local tra you know diverting local traffic onto a wife onto a a, la a LAN or something like that, whatever that's called, uh, that you may you, you may be hitting a few different uh, uh, unlicensed uh, path path segments, not just one. So I think that that is that encourages. I, I like this draft when it came out, which is um, doesn't matter to, you know, to anything. But I think I think that if the if it's the case that um, different unlicensed path links may be using different markings um, without any guidance at all. Uh, I think I think that that argues a bit more that moving this forward is a good thing to do um, because 
you know, you're, you're kind of, you're kind of losing fidelity with, uh, you know, the intended, the intended, uh, Quality of quality of uh, experience, and it, you know, every time you're doing a hop, and so if those things are not consistent, uh, it seems like you'd be less uh, likely to to do something helpful. Um, I'll just I can kind of leave that there uh, for the minutes, but uh, I did want to ask um, how stable you expect this document to be. I've I read this draft. Before the 5G uh, uh, quality mechanisms were added, um, so I was just kind of thinking, oh well, this would be, you know, we would publish this as an RFC and kind of be finished for a while. But do you expect that, you know, they've been using QCI for a while, but you know, um, is this something that we're going to need to revisit every few years? Yeah, I think thank you. I think you you have a great point. Um, I was hoping to <laughs> to be done with the QCI. Um, of course, you know the IMT twenty twenty started you know, looking at the five uh, G a, a few a few years ago, and, and it seems that our three GPV friends have a, a ten year cycle. Um, so, but you oh, know they're okay. also very dynamic. <laughs> okay. So I'm expecting exactly to your point that we may have a stable draft. Uh, to which we may have to add, you know, some, uh, you know, updates for 6G or, 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 or traffic, you know, that, that can come as a, as critical for the evolution of 5G. So, yeah, yeah. I'm anticipating that will be a stable foundation and then a need for updates. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, so, but I mean, if you, if you're talking a 10 year cycle, that's different from a 2 year cycle. So, uh, <laughs> that, 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 you know, that, that's, that, that kind of goes to my next, uh, thing that I, that I wanted to be sure and say, which was. Um, it, it seemed like, it seemed like to me that, um, uh, publishing this as an RFC would be a good thing to do, uh, because again, the, uh, intended audience isn't just people who are, uh, running 3GPP networks, you know, and if, if they're using, you know, if, if everybody is marking the same on the unlicensed links, um, it might that might be a that might be a helpful thing to to do too, so you know I mean this is an informational draft and you know it's it doesn't have any more standing than anybody else who is doing um, diff serve you know and saying that th these are the code points you should be using, but I think I think that um, if work in this space is useful, uh, it would be useful it would be useful to more people than just the network providers. in line this is Sabir. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, go Thanks, ahead. Sabir. Okay, Jeremy, thanks for the update. Um, uh, I will actually um, start with the same slide you have, uh, what Venture mentioned, but um, there could be a scenario that um, although UE is connecting through Wi-Fi, it's still going through the same uh, operator's network. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, do you anticipate in that case, or any recommendation? I have not checked your updated draft. Uh, any recommendation that that scenario should uh, use the same uh, marking what the operator use for the other link, because that's a clear distinction. Because if it is uh, managed by the same operator, right, or configured by the operator. They may not use a different kinds of uh, uh, a scheme, uh, as you are saying here that PCU is completely managed by the enterprise cloud, and it is configured by the enterprise cloud. Yeah, thank you, Subir. Um, you know, my general thinking is that carriers know what they are doing. Uh, so if they are in control of both links. You know they are perfectly capable without any draft from 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 our side uh, to decide if they want to prioritize one of the paths or if they want to treat equally both paths. And in which case, you know they will apply whatever marking they think is relevant uh, to make that uh, those two paths equivalent. Um, so you know this is not typically a case where this draft would be useful. I would see a draft this draft more useful when an enterprise has an SLA uh, negotiation and dialogue with a carrier. 
uh, at the end of which they have a view of what QCR or QFI would be used, and they would be in control of the other link. And what they would like to do is to align the other link uh, to the uh, um, 3GPP treatment. Um, if it's a one entity controlling both, you know, they can do like we say in RC 40, 4594, they're in full control, so they can do whatever they want, and they don't need any any guidance from anyone. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I will check that um, check that your updated draft. But um, do you think that the draft should make this clear? Because that would I, confuse I that is. scenario. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think it is clear, but please tell me if you think it is not. In which case, you know, I'll add more words to make it clear. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think you're next. Uh, yeah, just just a quick note. Um, the table on page fourteen seems to be um, in a very very difficult layout. Might want to look at that. I will. Thank you. Page fourteen, you see, right? Page fourteen, the table. It looks awful. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. I'll. I'll. Yeah. Something happened that uh, these tables didn't like. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll fix that. David, you're next. Thank you. Let me go say a couple of things. First is um, process-wise. Um, historically, RFC uh, 4594 started out as informational uh, because it was unclear how widely we adopted. If we were to uh, revise and update 4594, it has been sufficiently widely adopted that it would likely uh, be issued as a best current practice. And that would be a plausible path forward for, for this document. Issue it as informational. Um, if it goes into widespread use and proves uh, useful in its context, comparably to 4594, then perhaps um, it, it, it has the opportunity to become, become a BCP down, down the line. Uh, I think this is digging in the right place. The other thing I was going to mention is there's a use case related to the one Subir was talking about where um, a cellular operator offers what amounts of cellular service over the internet, which may wind up uh, going Wi-Fi uh, into uh, into the uh, uh, the client device, uh, the phone. Yeah, agree. Thank you. Yep. Greg. And Greg, what? Hi. Thanks. Um, so, um, I, I make uh, one more comment. So, via, you're, you're, can you follow Greg? Uh, yes. Can I just m add one more comment, Jeremy? Uh, I think you, you're right after Greg, if you, if you, if you don't mind. Oh, I, I see. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, please. Sorry. Thank you. All right. Um, Sorry, Greg. So, uh, this is the, actually the first time I've taken a look at uh, this draft, and I had a question on um, Section 6, I, IANA considerations. It um, indicates that the document is allocating 14 uh, district code points. Um, uh, it also describes them as being pool one code points. Um, I would point out that only one of them actually is a pool one code point. Um, the other 13 code points, um, six of them are uh, pool two, which are for local use, and uh, seven of them are, are pool three. Um, I guess the, the main question is, um, it, am I understanding this correctly that this draft is proposing that IANA assign these 14 code points for the specific purposes identified here and, and that they are then um, allocated for that use globally? That is our suggestion, yes, yes, yeah. Okay, that's, that's a significant chunk of the available standardization space as well as a significant chunk of the local use space, which is not really IANA. Yes. Yes. Uh, th thank you for the end note. I'll I'll uh, I'll, uh, I'll check the pool uh, uh, definition. Um, and yes, you're, you're right. Yes, yes. And there are you know so many flows that are defined in 3GPP, 
that um, the serve have not defined in you know, RFC 4594 or others, um, that yeah, we came to the conclusion that there's a big gap to fill, yes, indeed. There are other potential uh, uses of uh, that code point space, in particular the NQB draft is defining one that conflicts with, uh, or is requesting one that conflicts with one that's being requested here as well, so. the chairs have noted that. Um, I'll also note as a chair on this that we don't normally allocate large numbers of DSCPs to to people in RFCs. Um, they're more a conserved resource that we um, expect people to, to work it out. So we, 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 we will need to revisit the number of code points and and how we deal with it. But the first point of action for you probably is to check IANA and to check the current status. Yes, will do. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Which brings us to Beer. Uh, thanks. Sorry, um, Paul, I you? Think, Go ahead. Um, one of the points uh, Greg mentioned, uh, you know, I forgot to mention that that is one of the very uh, critical uh, point that needs a greater review. Um, I would also like to add the other organization uh, with uh, our experience like ATAS, which is the American Telecom Standards. They also in their specification use some of the mapping, which is not even of course registered with the INA. So uh, the history of 3GPP also the way they have defined, they provided the flexibility for the operators to do their in, the, in their own network when they are not interoperable with others, right? So assigning this, uh, the code points, uh, the INA, and then globally used, uh, we have to be a little bit careful and make sure that, okay, uh, what other standards are not using and they are not recommending in their specification, which um, uh, we believe would be, you know, a difficult task for us to do. Uh, and that's the reason my, our understanding is that 3GPP kept that way and gave the operators and the service provider flexibility to do the mapping uh, in such a way so that they do not uh, uh, you know, cause any problem with other networks. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and this work is going to be coordinated with 3GPP if we do go ahead. We're, we're certainly not going to start specifying things that impact anyone else's use of technology. Um, oh, Spencer's next in line. Spencer. Hey, hang on, one, one, one quick. Sabir, were you intending to suggest that we also coordinate with an additional standards org beyond 3GPP? Yes, one of the things uh, in our understanding is ATAS. Would you type the name of that standards org and a web link for it into the chat or the etherpad so that we don't have a transcription problem? Yeah, um, I will do that. Atos is that uh, you know that uh, American telecom standards uh, uh, with the, all the operators and the vendors uh, join there, and I will send that uh, link later on. Uh, and there are also certain other services like um, there are a lot of uh, priority services which are also mapped in the network, and it's a country specific, uh, and that those things I think we should be really consulting and make sure that we are not overlapping that with other uh, code points and how they are using it in their network. And there's the GSMA specs and probably other ones as well that we would have to touch right. on if we did work in this space. Yes. So if, if, if I may note on, on that, um, Subir, thank you. And, and I, I think that um, there, there are two different types of uh, organizations, uh, logics. One is where um, vendors like carriers, for example, interoperate with each other uh, within uh, you know, their respective domains. And I think IR34 and the ETS uh, that you're referring are uh, uh, working towards that goal. Um, and another one is when traffic leaves uh, their uh, domain to be sent back to DeepServe, which is the domain where we are concerned here, uh, because you know we're not within carrier exchanges here, we, we are leaving the carrier domain um, and we try to have a parallel path that has the same uh, value. Um, and it seems that these uh, organizations have not treated that case. 
Um, IL-34, by the way, is very limited to a certain number of subsets of essential traffic types, but has not expanded into um, you know, all the uh, QSI, uh, Q, Q, uh, CI and QFI, uh, precisely because, as you say, carriers are you know, big guys, they know what they're doing, so they can interrupt with each other uh, without you know, guidance. Um, it's when we leave that domain that this problem um, uh, it, it, we face appears. But yeah, I agree with you, we need to double check um, the framework uh, that they are defining if it's the, the context of the interoperator or if it's outside of, uh, of their domain. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, you, you have actually uh, pointed out correctly. Uh, so that is remember the early on we mentioned about that if it is uh, clearly specifying that these are the use cases it is referring to, right? And uh, what Greg mentioned that in this draft, you are uh, asking for a large number of INA uh, code points, which are um, M is the universally interoperable, right? So that's what I am mentioning that we have to be careful and get a good review from every organization see if there are right. And um, I will also look at that uh, some of these ETAS recommendation, and uh, I can offline mention to you that what you know if there isn't some of the issues. But as in the working group, I think we should be careful before we assign them. And I think chairs already pointed out that. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. That puts Martin in the queue, I think. Yeah, just following up on Greg's comment, are, are we actually, uh, I guess I'm confused, are we actually assigning new DSCPs or are we just using existing DSCPs and mapping them to pre-GCP behaviors? So in this draft, we do both. We try to map to existing DSCPs as much as possible. But we also conclude that some traffic types defined by 3GPP just don't have any equivalent in you know, RFC 4594 or any other defining traffic types. And then we conclude that the new DSCP would be needed if we wanted to translate the same intent on the uh, deserved domain. This is David. I think a conclusion that a new one, is, new one would be needed is fine. I think going ahead and allocating the takes it significantly further and might not be a good thing to do. Right. Understood. Yep. It is certainly something which um, would require quite a lot of discussion. So um, I'm, um, I, I'm, well, I, I'm going to let other people talk and then I think we'll say something at the end um, to try and tidy up. Um, Martin's still in the queue, I think. Martin, do you want to be in the queue? No, um, I, there was a net one, a queue in there, and I just used it. That's fine. You can always put yourself in the queue. That's your privilege. Spencer, are you meant to be in the queue? Also meant to be unmuted, sorry. Um, so uh, just to make sure that we're not uh, telling the authors to bring us a rock, and then they bring us another rock, and that's still the wrong rock. Um, and can we give any guidance for um, what the definition of a non-large number would be for the for the authors? It doesn't have to be now, but um, what, what actually, I'm actually, Spencer, this is even easier. This this is not going to be a standards track document. Therefore, it cannot allocate uh, it cannot allocate DSCPs. Full stop. That suggests okay. that the right thing for the authors to do is to suggest places where new DSCPs would be useful and write separate docs, to, separate contained docs to allocate them uh, based on individual use. So, so this is, so the, the informa, informational draft is the guidance uh, and it's informational and that when it, when it matters, uh, the standards track documents are the ones that allocate one or two. The standard tracks documents will be parallels to the uh, N, uh, NQB PHB draft that Greg is working on. Right. So uh, that's the right structure going forward. That you were you were coming at you were coming at this a a, a different way than I was and a a better way, which surprises no one. Thank you. 
So, so if I can try and summarize a little bit where I think we've got and see if people agree. Um, this whole idea of doing work in this space was presented to the working group. Um, a draft was written. People have talked about it. I'll talk more today. Um, clearly, this sort of work requires various pieces of expertise. It requires expertise in understanding how the technology works. And it requires expertise in understanding how vendors and other standards bodies are using that technology. And it will also require some standardization decisions if we're going to specify anything new. This is quite a, a big thing to start. So I don't think the working group will actually start any of that activity yet. I'm hugely interested in discussion about this and in making progress in the right direction because if people are not arguing, I think we're heading in a good place. David, do you want to add anything? I would simply uh, reinforce the uh, themes we've been running throughout this that um, careful coordination with at least three GPP is going to be is is going to be essential here. Uh, I don't think that's news to anybody. Hey, right, so uh, please comment on the draft. Please, Jerome, would you revise this and bring it back again? Because I think there is interest in looking at what it contains. And Absolutely. talk to us about how to make this go forward in some way. Does that seem fair enough? Fair enough. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. It, it, it looks like we don't have any of the 3GPP people that we've been talking to about this draft on this call. So we're probably going to have to make pro, uh, take proactive measures um, to reach out and get their input. Oh, yeah. I will do that too. Yes. Yeah. Martin, do you need to be in the loop on that? You probably do. Yeah, probably. Um, I would ask the chairs, do we think, I mean, we can do the informational draft without biting off the standards bit immediately do, do, the, do the chairs believe that the level work in just getting this informational draft to the happy place is a bit of it this time i think we need to see another rep before we can actually make that call because um uh, we were so pleased that people uh, were throwing uh, poison darts at this and fiery fireballs <laughs> So, um, yeah, the, the chairs would like to see another revision. And Jerome, you got some feedback. So um, I think you know some of the things to do in that. And in the meantime, we will touch base with the 3GPP um, liaison in the IETF just to make sure that um, they now think this is um, not really horrible. Because they thought it was really horrible, actually, when we started. But they didn't understand quite what was being proposed. As the likely responsible the working group chair for this draft, I think we want to see the new version first because I think we need to remove the implication that this draft will allocate DSCPs before going back to uh, back to 3GPP on this. Sounds good. I'll, I'll take care of that very soon. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you. And thank, thank you for putting up with this. Uh, I think you knew you were stepping into an interesting space uh, when you've got uh, these two uh, uh, fairly sizable uh, standards standards communities involved. Yes, <laughs> I was <laughs> expecting wind. <laughs> I'm happy it blows because <laughs> this is needed. Thank you. All right, I think we should be looking to wrapping up this meeting as I'm pretty sure I see at least one uh, participant from Asia in the call where it's something like midnight or worse. Yeah, I think that's a good thing. Is there anybody who wants to come to the queue and say anything before we close this session? Is there anything that you think uh, we should know about that we haven't yet covered? Well, um, in that case, um, thank you ever so much for uh, participating. Um, personally, I would rather have gone to Vancouver, but um, um, wherever you are, I wish that you, you stay well, you 
you get better if you need to get better, and um, thank you for your participation. Uh, we will um, follow up this meeting uh, via the email list. Please use the email list, and we will have another interim later this month. But un until then, goodbye. Thank you very much, everybody, for taking the time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah.